Professor Alan uh, Lauda continues his uh, yesterday's lecture on the category by not invariance and uh, from whole duality. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to make a little cheat sheet here um, because I, I think we went a little bit quickly at the end of last talk. So we have this graphical model for this particular representation. And if you aren't comfortable with the representation, then maybe it starts to get a little, a little complex there. But here's the sort of cheat sheet for you. We have this category, which depends on three different parameters. And the category is basically built out of these sequences where the sum of these numbers add up to n, capital N. Just like basically what happens when we take this wedge power and we break it up. We get m tensor factors, these uh, wedge powers are going to different things which sum to the capital number n. And each of these tensor factors is a particular SLN representation, namely a fundamental uh, SLN representation. So this is your cheat sheet. Uh, because you might ask yourself, well, in that example I did where I did the Kaufman bracket, I chose some very specific numbers here. And the question is, you know, how, how do you figure out which numbers to stick in there? And here's your cheat sheet. If you want to do SLN link homology theory, then the n here, what these labels can be, anywhere from 0 to n, that's how you choose the n. If you want SLN link invariant, you let these numbers go from 0 to n. If you want to be braiding an n-fold tensor product, then you have to use SLM. In my talk, for simplicity, most of the examples, m is 2. I'm only grading 2 tensor factors. Because for the skein theory, the, the graphical description of the representation categories, most of the relations are on two strands, you know, this bygone relation and those sorts of things. And then n, this is the number which controls which tensor factors you, you see showing up. Because the sum of these has to equal n. So suppose I want to braid uh, you know, I'm in SL2 theory and I want to break V tensor V, the two-dimensional representation. Well, the sum of those numbers is 2, because V is wedge 1 of V, and V is V wedge. So the sum of those indices there is 2, so that tells me that I should pick capital N equals 2. So here's your cheat sheet, and just to make sure that everything I said last time is fully absorbed, let's look at the SL3 theory. So we'll invent Cooperberg's SL3 calculus just using this category here. So here's a picture again of how things work. These things have labels and you should think of them as being a certain thickness. And a strand can either decide to give up a string to his neighbor to either side. So I'm drawing the arrows kind of to indicate who decided to give up a strand. So A2 gave up one of his strands and this one increased by one. He gave up a strand but he picked up a strand from A3 so A2 stayed the same. You can sort of see what's happening here. Now, the rules are, if ever any of these numbers is outside of the range of 0 to n, then it's 0. We don't, that can't happen. It can't happen when you, know, you get negative numbers or numbers bigger than n. And we also, to make our pictures kind of more beautiful, we say that whenever this number is 0 or n, we don't draw it. We just leave it out of our picture. And what does that mean? That means that... Uh, because those are the trivial representations. If I take the zeroth wedge power, that's the trivial representation. Similarly, if I take wedge n of cn, that's a trivial representation. So we're not going to draw those in our graphical calculus. And remember, the whole story here, the, the way you invent the relations, are just to demand that SLM 
act on this category. So this M and this M are intended to be the same here. And how does it act? Well, these idempotents 1 sub lambda, remember lambda is a M minus 1 tuple. You just get lambda by finding which uh, boundary points um, will reproduce the weight lambda that you have. And again, you can solve this equation because you fixed what the sum of these coefficients is. And EIs goes to the one where you move a strand between the I and I plus first. So here's our conventions, don't draw lines. And now let's just like, let's invent the SL3 spider, the, the graphical description of the SL3 representation category using this action of SLM on these pictures. So, all right, I'm going to look at this representation, which is equivalent to looking at uh, three, two, and three. Why did I choose this representation? Well, I wanted to have things involving one and two, like wedge one, tensor wedge two. I wanted to have things colored by the, you know, the first fundamental weight and the second fundamental weight. In order to have that, I know that the sum of these two numbers has to be three. So that's why I chose capital N equals three here. I want to talk about SL3 theory, so my N was three. And I'm going to be talking about two tensor factors, so I chose this to be two. So this is your cheat sheet to kind of uh, stick in there. So here's a picture of this big representation. This is the representation theoretic description of what's going on. The weight space is here, and this is uh, the difference between these two numbers is three. So this is weight space three, weight space one, minus one, minus three. The E's move us two to the right. F's move us two to the left. And when we convert this, representation theory into our graphical model, it looks like this. Again, our conventions are that we read the pictures from right to left. And uh, so for example, this guy, oh, for SL3, there's a convention that we use. So on the previous slide, I, I wasn't really using orientations. And here, I probably shouldn't have been. But uh, for SL3, we have a convention to make the pictures easier. This is Cooperberg's convention. So SL3 is that we write uh, D, the three-dimensional representation, as an arrow going this way. And wedge two of D, we write as an arrow going the other way. So a strand labeled one is an arrow going to the left. A strand labeled two is an arrow going to the right. This just makes the calculus a little bit simpler. And then notice all of our trivalent vertices are either sources or sinks. So this is in, to, to make this more look like what Cooperberg did. So for example, when I apply F to this weight three, I should get something in weight one. The difference between these is one, good. And here's your picture. Remember, we don't draw zero and three because they correspond to the trivial representation. So this thickness three strand decides to give up one strand to his neighbor. So now he has one and he only has two. And this kind of looks like a little cup here. So this is the picture. Now, we've drawn the picture, but we have to impose the relations from SL2. We have to enforce these pictures to be an SL2 representation. So let's start by looking at this very highest weight. The relation says that if I do E and then F, that that should be equal to FE plus quantum integer three on this weight space. And notice on zero, three, it should be times the identity on this weight space, right? What does the identity on zero, three look like? It should be some strings going from zero to three to zero, three, which don't change. But because we don't draw either of these, this is just an empty diagram. So the identity map on, on the weight space one, three, on zero, three, it just looks like this, because these are both the trivial representations. In general, the identity maps look like the perfectly horizontal lines, but because we're not drawing these, it's just the empty set. So when I do this, uh, what I get is that Fe, like, so first apply F, then apply E, that looks like this little circle. This guy's zero, because I fall off the edge. And this is quantum three times 
the identity on 103. That's the empty picture. So we've invented that whatever this theory is, this circle looking thing should evaluate to the quantum integer 3. And similarly, if we go and we look at what happens if I do the SL2 relation here, E, F, F, E, we get this picture. So let's, let's try and see. I'm doing it in weight one. So we should try and see this diagram show up somewhere. So it says, if I first do this picture, and then I glue this onto the right, you can see that we'll get a diagon there. Whereas if I first do this picture, I have a cup, and I glue this guy, I'll have a cap. So this is cup, cap, and diagon. So that's exactly what's happening here. And it says this should be equal to quantum one, times the identity in this weight space. So on this weight space, the identity looks like two horizontal lines, one labeled one and one labeled two. So perfectly identity. So we've invented this square relation just by um, imposing the SL2 relation. One thing that's important here is that we really are using the integral structure of the quantum group. I told you that if you work over the integers, these divided powers become really important. They're like, they're more fundamental objects. So they're defined like this, where the divided power is equal to, uh, you know, the, this, where we, this is the rational, the product of all the um, quantum integers. So how do we represent a divided power in the calculus? Remember, E is where one strand decides to hop over to his neighbor. If we do a divided power, we just, that, we just let that many strands hop over. So E divided power K is represented by letting K strands hop over all at once. So you see down here the relation which says E2 should be equal to quantum 2 times the divided power. All I've done here is I've taken this quantum K and moved it over here, right? So that says E to the K should be equal to some quantum factorial times this. So how do I draw E2? Well, I first apply an E, give up one strand. Then I apply another E, give up another strand. What does divided power 2 look like? It just says, well, he just gives up all his strands at once. He gives up two strands at once. So you see we're exactly getting the diagon for the curve. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, if you look at the square relation yeah. uh, and the term uh, at the far right, uh, then uh, the top uh, line it's fatter than the, the it's <laughs> this is just a screwed up in the LaTeX. It shouldn't it shouldn't oh you're saying it's fatter because it's thickness two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, no, because um, and so this will eventually become a scheme relation. And will this fact that uh, uh, the information uh, that the top line is fat and the lower line is thinner, will that be lost in the scheme relation? Well, I mean, what really that thickness is telling you is which fundamental representation. So this is a question about, this is a relation involving wedge one and wedge two. Mm -hmm. So this is like the first, the, the defining representation, and this is its uh, dual. Mm -hmm. So uh, the thicknesses are telling you which representations you're talking about. That's mm -hmm. kind of encoding it in there. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're not familiar with Cooperberg's calculus, this is what it looks like. And if you are, then this should look very familiar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, you also get the other one. So, so you can actually generate all the isotopies that you want uh, within the ladder diagrams. Okay, so here's a question. Let's build our braiding, but which representations do we want to braid? Like, you know, which SL3 representations would we like to construct the braiding for? Let's do the one where they're both labeled by the defining representation. So let's, let's braid V tensor V, where V is the the three dimension or the defining representation of SL3. So what is the exterior power we need to, to braid that? It's just uh, one, right? For, for the defining representation, wedge one of V is just what we're calling V. So if I want to braid this guy, I need to have my sum be two. Because then the sum of, if I want to try and braid this guy, wedge one V, tensor wedge 1 V, I need that the sum of these things adds up to 2. So that's how I chose this particular representation was I wanted to braid these two guys. So I chose this number to be 2. 
I still want to braid SL3 representations, and I'm only considering two tensor factors. So that's how I chose these, this representation. So sitting here in weight space zero, so this is weight, then remember the weight space for SL2 is just the difference between these numbers. So this guy sitting in weight space zero, that's V, what, that's V tensor B. So how do we construct the braiding? Well, the quantum vial group action. Remember, the quantum vial group action gives us a map from weight N to weight minus N. So if we're sitting in weight zero, the quantum vial group action gives us a map from this guy to itself. And if you go back and remember what that formula for the vial group action, it was this big infinite sum. But again, it, it falls off the edge very quickly. So it's only two terms, one sub zero and Q E F. So the braiding that comes from the quantum vial group action should be equal to the identity minus Q F E. So this is the identity and this is Q F E. And again, those that are familiar with Cooperberg's calculus, this is exactly the relation that you see. Maybe we'll see Qs in different places. Yes. Is there a reason that you place the four pictures on the upper part of it, on top and below the E and F arrows? Yeah, because this is the action of E, right? Like, I'm de like how did I invent this? I demanded that SLM act on the pictures. So this guy is, he is the action of F. Like the, the way that F acts is by having this guy give up a string, and the way E acts is by. And notice it's changing the weight in exactly the way that it should, and then all we're doing is forcing the relations to hold. And forcing the relations to hold invents the scheme theory. Um, yeah, so that, that's like the key idea here is that these pictures are very, very generic. They only become interesting once we start forcing them to satisfy SLM relations, as we've done it here. Because by forcing, these types of SL, SL2 relations, we were inventing the scheme theory. So this is just a normal SL2 relation. So this is, I find this very beautiful. It's saying that the quantum group relations already know about all the scheme theory that you were, were writing down. You didn't have to study the intertwiners from V tensor, its dual, and break those intertwiners up into pieces. You just invented it using the skew algorithm. algorithm. So the thing that I really like about this is that a knot can actually be interpreted now as just an element in the quantum group. To be exactly, to be more precise, it's a certain quotient of the quantum group called the Scherk quotient. But uh, it's not, it's not critical for what I'm saying. So what is a knot? It's going to be a map from the trivial representation to the trivial representation. So remember, three and zero; these are all the trivial representations. So. What I've done here is I create a cup cap by taking three and zero and turning it into one, two. I create a cup cap here. I apply the braiding coming from the quantum vial group action. I apply another uh, F and an E. So if you look at this, what did I do? I first applied F sub three, because remember three operates between the third strand. So this guy here where he gives up a strand, this is applying an F on the third rung. Then I apply an E on the first rung. Then in the middle rung, I apply the quantum vial group action twice. Then I apply uh, E on the third rung and an F on the bottom rung. So we've taken our knot and we've turned it into an element in the quantum group. And there's a you can always do this. There's a always you know the, you can always take an, uh, a knot and put it into this ladder form. And then the question is, well, do I always get the same element? Yes, you always get the same element in the quotient that I was talking about. So you can turn a knot into elements in the quantum group. And the really cool thing is that to compute some of these invariants, it's actually kind of interesting how you can do it. Because in this representation that I was looking at, this, this represents a sort of a highest, uh, it's, this is in the orbit of the highest weight. So if we apply an E to this weight, we're going to fall off the edge of the Earth, right? E will change these numbers to where they're too great. So one thing that you can do is just write out this, this uh, sum, right? The, the quantum vial group is a sum of two terms. So let's write out this sum. I have a big string of E's and F's. Let's use the quantum group relations to move all the E's over to the right. Once you move all the E's over to the right, they kill this weight space. So that, those terms die. 
The only terms that survive are the terms that I pick up. I'm going to get a bunch of copies of the identity with a bunch of cues around. That's exactly the polynomial that shows up in the SLN link homology theory. So let me just say that again, because that's a key point which tells you how to, when you categorify, this is what lets you actually compute things. All that matters is the identity in this representation, because E's kill this weight. So if I do all the SL2 rela the relations and try and move all my E's over to the right, I get something where all the E's kill this. So remember, when I commute an E and an F, I pick up some quantum, some Q's times the identity. So those Q's that are left over after I've moved all the E's to the right, that's your knot invariant. So it somehow tells you that the only thing that really matters is just, want, just to write everything in terms of these ones. It's, it's, a beautiful, it's an interesting fact because when you categorify it, it actually tells you how to compute these SLN link invariants. Okay, so this was the decategorified story, just to give you a flavor of how you can use just your knowledge of SLN and the quantum bio group action to invent uh, SLN link theories. So Kalvitz, Kamnitzer, and Morrison used this approach to actually prove this conjecture. Um, there was a conjectured description of this category of representations. Um, namely, it's uh, you know, this given by these pictures of the form I was showing. And it was not, they weren't able to prove it until they started using this uh, skew-how approach. So we now have a, a generators and relations description of the category of representations of the quantum group for SLN. So this gives you a quick way to see SLN link invariants and their skin theory directly from the quantum group in the deformed bio direction. This is something that maybe a lot of you are wondering about, and this is also a key idea in what I was saying. When I started this talk, I said all SLN link invariant homologies, not just link homologies where your colors are fundamental weights. So how, how can you get the other representations, these higher representations? Well, there's certain projectors which are analogs of the Jones-Wenzel projector. Now you think, okay, well great, I have to figure out how to compute the Jones-Wenzel projector. That doesn't seem that, I mean, that seems kind of hard. That doesn't seem like it has to do with this, all the, you know, your, my, my story to you was that everything you need to know is the quantum group and the quantum bio group action. So how, these Jones-Wenzel projectors sound like something much more complicated. Well, there's another beautiful idea due to Kautis and Rosansky independently, where you can actually prove that to construct these higher projectors, these things which project onto these uh, interesting representations, you can do that by taking this braiding and doing an infinite twist. So if you have a tensor product of some guys, you do an infinite twist on those, and that projects onto the represent, uh, you know, a given higher representation. The point is that the infinite twist eventually stabilizes, so you can, um, you know, it actually is, a, you only need to do a finite number of twists before it stabilizes. But the point is that the quantum bio group action also supplies a way to get the other representations. So it's not just SL2, or you know, fundamental weights, you can do all, all your uh, highest weight representations of SLN. And again, this is my whole reason for trying to think about things this way is that we want to categorify. So let me just give a, just a quick like spiel about categorification because uh, maybe some people are not are sort of new to the subject and not, not completely sure. So this actually showed up uh, when in uh, Kashayev's talk earlier. This is the motivating problem where people started to think about this. They were looking at triangulation invariance in two dimensions, so Crane and Frankel. They were looking at the Pachner moves in two dimensions, and they were observing what kind of a structure do I need in order for that to be invariant under Pachner moves. And basically, you need an algebra. The 2-2 Pachner move tells you that you need something like a multiplication that's associative. Now, when you jump and go to three dimensions, what, what types of structures do you need to get invariants of three-dimensional three Pachner moves? And the point was the instead of having the 2-2 move where associative is now an equation, Associative became a higher relation. The three-two move now told you that associ the, associ the associativity had to satisfy the associator. So rather than having an algebra, you now need some kind of higher structure, a category. And that category should have a multiplication. So it's kind of like an algebra, but instead of being associative, it's only associative up to isomorphism. So this idea that to jump in dimensions, to go from two to three, we needed to take a structure which was like an algebra 
and turn it into something which is like a category. That was where this idea of categorification came from. That, that's where the word categorification came from because to go from two to three, you had to categorify the notion of an algebra. So their, their idea, their dream was really that if you wanted to get four manifold invariants, you should categorify again. So take whatever structures are giving you nice three manifold invariants and categorify them to get four manifold invariants. So that was really where this dream of categorifying quantum groups began, was to try and get to these four manifold invariants. So here's a little bit about higher representation theory, just to sort of give you a, get your feet wet a little bit. Um, in higher representation theory, instead of looking for actions of a Lie, a Lie algebra or a quantum group on a vector space, you try and find representations where the quantum group acts on categories. So you want to find some categories, and you have to think a little bit about what everything means, because um, for this to make sense, we usually need the category to be graded and additive. So additive means that we can take direct sums of objects in our category. So think about the category of modules over a ring. In that category, I can take two modules, take their direct sum, and if these modules, if my rings were graded, then I could take the grading shift. You know, this category would be graded because given any module over a graded ring, a graded module over a graded ring, I can shift its grading up or down. So these are the kinds of categories that we're going to need, and why do we need that? Well, direct sum is going to mirror our addition in the quantum group, and the grading shift is going to be, act a little bit like our quantum parameter Q. So we're really working at generic Q in this story. So I can do things like take the direct sum over an object by some quantum, by some Laurent polynomial, and what does that mean? Well, quantum 3, when you write it out, just looks like this, this, this Laurent polynomial. So we just take as many copies as we see here and shift the grading by whatever powers we see. So A, shift it by 2, etc. So this is in some kind of additive category. And what does it mean to have a sort of categorical representation of a quantum group? Well, let's go back to our SL2 story. So what's a categorical representation of UQSL2? Well, we just pick a bunch of graded additive categories for each weight, just like we did before. So these used to be vector spaces, now they're categories. We pick a bunch of functors that go from different weight spaces, just as before, functors E and F. We have a bunch of identity functors, that should be a lambda. The identity functors on each category, those are the projectors. And we just want these functors to satisfy isomorphisms. Actually, this should be a lambda too, sorry. Um, we want these functors to satisfy isomorphisms. So it says that the functor of applying f of an e is isomorphic as functors to the functor of applying e of an f, direct sum a bunch of copies of the identity functor with their gradings shifted. So we're looking for categories with, functor, with functorial actions of the quantum group subject to these isomorphisms. So are these isomorphisms canonical? That's the real question, yeah. I mean, so this would be the most naive and probably the most boring definition that you would think of. The real answer is like, yeah, where is this isomorphism coming from? You know, when I categorify, I want to see some new structure, right? When we, when we talk about link invariants, you know, we, we can take invariants of tangles and things like that. But the whole point about categorifying link invariants is that they're better than just getting link invariants. Whenever you have braid cobordisms, so some kind of two-dimensional surface embedded in four space that goes between two, two knots or tangles, you're supposed to get a map between those. There's supposed to be some higher, richer structure in categorified quantum groups, not just these you know, non-canonical isomorphisms between you know, these relations. So that, that's the question. What is the higher structure in categorical representation theory? And the idea is to, I mean, if you were trying to study this problem, what you might do is go back to this picture look at an example of such a categorical representation and start to study what natural transformations do I see between these functors. You know, are there any natural transformations from the functor E to itself or E squared to itself? This would be some higher level structure that we've never seen before, right? Because when we're talking about quantum group, it doesn't make sense to say, well, do I have a map from E to E? I mean, E is an element in a quantum group. You know, it's an element of an algebra. What's a map between an element? Well, when E is a functor, that does make sense because you know, this is a two category, so I can talk about natural transformations between these functors. 
And that's really where the magic happens, is in these natural transformations. And uh, the point is that those SL2 isomorphisms, as, as Stavros was talking about, those should follow from some new higher structure. There should be some canonical maps going one way and going the other. There should be some new relations. So this is like a new world of quantum groups. So all the quantum group relations, if you've got to where when you see the quantum group relations, your eyes glaze over, they look boring. You know, I've seen these a million times. There's a higher level where all of those equations follow from some new structure. And that's what I want to tell you a little bit about. So it takes a whole talk to really motivate this definition and tell you where it came from. I'm happy to answer any questions, but here's the definition of the categorified quantum group. So you have objects just as before, indexed by the weights. The morphisms are just strings of E's and F's, and I'm allowed to take grading shifts. So you should think of this as just like the quantum group, right? In the quantum group, I had products of E's and F's, and I had multiplication by Q, and I could take direct, or I could take sums of these types of things. In the category, we're going to take direct sums, so this is additive. So I can take direct sums of things like this, and then what's this new structure I was telling you about? The new, the new world of categorified quantum groups, what is there? There's these kinds of maps. So let's look a little bit at what's happening here. There's a new map that goes from E to itself. So my convention is that I draw E as an upward arrow. So now I'm rotating my pictures, but it'll make sense a little bit later. So diagrams now are read from bottom to top. And if you look at it, this is a two categorical structure. So the the quantum group we said was a category last time, right? The objects were weights, the morphisms were the parts that went between the weights. So when we categorify, now we have a two category. Objects are weights, morphisms look like quantum group guys, and the two morphisms are something new that we haven't seen before. So this picture tells me as I go from right to left that this upward arrow is taking me from weight n to weight n plus 2. So that's why an upward arrow is like an e. And if you don't like these, I mean, I'm in a topology conference, so of course you like pictures, but if these pictures are a little confusing, all you should think about is there's some map that goes from E to itself, and it has degree 2. It's a, I draw it as a dot just to make things simple. There's a map that goes from E to itself, has degree 2. There's a map that goes from E squared to itself, has degree minus 2. Likewise for the Fs. And here's some new things. We have these caps and cups. And if I'm reading them from bottom to top, there's no strings down here at the bottom. So I think of that as just the idempotent, 1 sub n. So there's some map from 1 sub n into E, F. So the downward arrow is the F, the upward arrow is the E. And there's some shift associated with this. So it has some degree which depends on the weight. So these are like, you know, if you were saying to trying to tell someone about quantum groups and you say, well, you know, you have a bunch of E's and F's, they satisfy some relations. These things are like the E's and F's. These are the new E's and F's. These are the new the two morphisms. So now the question is, what are the relations between these new generators? Well, the first one is a topological invariance. And the people that are more familiar with this, this, this kind of says that the E and F are, are bi-adjoint to each other. They're both a left and a right adjoint. If you don't know that, don't worry about it just says that we can wiggle these strings, straighten these wiggly strings out. And if I take a upward pointing dot and I bend it around in, in two possible ways, that's what we're going to call a downward dot. So it's saying that you can take these pictures and wiggle them around however you like. Same thing with the crossings. This relation is probably the most interesting because it really governs the structure of the positive part of the quantum group. It's the nil Hecke algebra. So this should look a little bit like how maybe you would draw symmetric group elements. Don't think braiding, because these things don't look like a braid, right? Think like the symmetric group. Normally you would have, if this was like a SI, an elementary transposition, you have SI squared equals 1. But in this case, we have SI squared is 0. They still satisfy this uh, braid-like relation. And they interact with the dots in this interesting way. So when you slide the dots through a crossing, you, you get up this extra term. Again. This, isn't, this shouldn't be somehow familiar to you. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you this new structure that, that you know, lives over the quantum group. There's a last set of relations which are best incorporated in the, this diagram. So we want to construct canonical isomorphisms from this big direct sum into this guy, right? We want this object to be isomorphic to this big direct sum. 
and my conventions are going all over the place. I wasn't using 20 brackets. This should be. This is just a gradient shift. So I have a big direct sum here, and I'd like to construct an isomorphism. And if you look at it, there's sort of natural pictures you can draw, right? Going from one sub n to ef, I can stick a cup. But now I need the degree to increase by two. Well, I can just stick a dot on there. And then if I go over here, I need the degree to increase by two again, so stick another dot. So just keep sticking dots on them as you move over, and those increase the degree by two. So that's why the grading is shifting here. This sideways guy, you're probably asking yourself, I don't remember him defining a sideways guy, but if you take a upward pointing guy, and let's see here, and you bend him around, now you have up, down, down, up. So you can bend him around, it doesn't matter which way you do it by those relations that I drew earlier. That's this relation that goes on the, that's this guy here. So the only relation that we have is that this is an isomorphism. For what I'm going to do, it's not critical that we get into the guts of this, like what it means for that to be an isomorphism. But the point is there's a canonical isomorphism from here to here. It involves these bubbles and there's some sums. This turns out to have a very close relationship with symmetric functions and some combinatorics. But let's not worry too much right now about these relations. Although I will tell you, if you've ever studied foam relations in any SLN link homology theory, those foam relations are this. These are all foam relations for any SLN link homology theory you've seen. So that's the categorified quantum group. And again, you're probably asking yourself, where on earth did this stuff come from? Like, why is this the right definition? Well, I didn't. I guess I took it off this slide, but um, I can prove that this this there's a decategorification functor called taking the growth and deep group of a two category. When you do that, you get exactly the quantum group. If you look at the objects in this category, which cannot be broken up into any further direct sums, that gives you a basis, which is exactly Lustig's canonical basis. So this two category is very much based on Lustig's approach, geometric realization of the quantum group. Very, it's a, basically a combinatorial model for the perverse sheaves on the, on the quiver variety in general. Um, okay, so I, I appreciate that I went sh shockingly too quick over the quantum group. This is mostly just motivation so you can see this, the story. Yeah. The canonical basis and the square or spider basis. They're not the same. They're not the same. Correct. Well, we haven't done skew how yet, right? Uh, I mean, this is this this has right now. I'm doing. We're like. I'm just telling you, like, uh, how to categorify the pieces, right? To do the 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 skein theory, the webs. To do the webs, we needed two ingredients: the quantum group and the quantum bio group action. So I'm telling you, here's how you categorify the quantum group. I'm going to tell you how to categorify the bio group action, and then we'll just see what what happens. And I'm mostly just kind of sketching at this point, just to give you a flavor, because of course it gets a little bit technical. But the point is, the point of the talk, this talk, is that you can do everything from the previous talk and invent link homology. So remember, I told you that that uh, alternating sum that we saw for the quantum bio group action was just dying to become a, a complex, a chain complex. Why is that? Because the, anything with a minus sign is in odd degree in the chain complex. Anything with a plus sign is an even degree in the chain complex. This is a pretty uh, prevalent idea in link homology theory that you know, if you want to categorify things that have a minus sign, you have to use complexes. Anything with a minus sign is an odd degree. Anything with a plus sign is an even degree. So here is this alternating sum, if you think even, odd, even, odd, even, odd. But it wouldn't even make sense to ask this thing to be a complex unless you had this higher structure, you know, maps going between F's and E's, that, that sort of a thing. And I didn't tell you about the divided powers, but I'll just say that these differentials are defined using those morphisms that we drew in the previous picture. There are certain pictures you draw that go between this, and those are, those are how you define a differential. You show that the differential squared is zero. And Chuang, Rukier, and uh, Kautis, Kemmerer, Okada they actually show that these complexes, if I have some categorical representation and I take an object and I tensor it with this complex. 
So now you might get a little bit worried because if I started with a graded additive category and now I tensor it with a complex, I'm going to leave that world. So we need to work in a world where we have chain complexes and so don't be worried if you don't know about derived categories. This is, just think like the category of complexes up to homotopy. So I need to be able to take an object in this category, tensor it with this chain complex. That's going to produce an object, a chain complex of objects in this category. And the claim is that the action of tensoring with this complex has an inverse. And what it does is it gives you an equivalence between this category in weight minus lambda and this category in weight plus lambda. And I would argue that this idea is probably the singlest, singly most powerful thing that has been done with categorified quantum groups. So these equivalences that we're constructing, these are incredibly non-trivial equivalences. So we're getting an equivalence from one category to another. And if you, Chuang and Ruquier's original construction, they were actually studying an example where these categories were um, blocks of the symmetric group and finite characteristics. So we're getting back to like real, you know, old-fashioned mathematics, modular representation theory of the symmetric group. And these are derived categories of blocks over those symmetric groups. They were able to construct equivalences that were actually not known. So this was an old conjecture called the abelian defect conjecture, a Bruet conjecture, and it was proven by Chuang Ruquier by constructing this categorical action and building this derived equivalence in exactly this way. So the point here is that these complexes are, are incredibly powerful. They're proving new results about modular representation theory of the symmetric group. Kavis, Kemeter, and Lakata use them to construct some derived equivalences in, uh, uh, in some geometric categories. So they were trying to prove some equivalence between a certain derived category of coherent sheaves and another one. They proved that using these types of uh, these exact equivalences. And for our purposes, those complexes are interesting because they give us the categorified gradient and link homology theory. So I'm hoping that this convinces you that these complexes are incredibly powerful. They can prove things about symmetric groups, they can prove things about geometry, and for us, they can construct the braiding for us in an SLM link homology theory. So, basically, you just don't think anymore. I've told you all the ingredients, now stop thinking. Just do the same thing we did before. So we want to build a two-functor to some category, which has the same parameters as our web guide, but now it's going to have an extra layer. The ones of lambdas go just like before, e's go just like before, s just like before, and now we need to just invent another layer of this story. So this guy was a map that went from e to itself. So e was represented in the webs as this web. So I need something which goes from this web to this web. So let's use our topological intuition and draw a surface where at the bottom I have this web and at the top I have this web. So there's something which is going from this guy to this guy. Let's stick a dot on it. Let's just draw, you know, we're inventing this, this category. Why not stick a little dot there? And that's meant to be sort of a cross section of this picture. It really is the case that you get the pictures that we see here are going to appear as cross sections of the pictures that we see here. The crossings between different colored strands, I only told you the SL2 category, but you can actually categorify the quantum group for any quantum group, any quantum group associated to a B algebra. Um, for SL2, this is going from E squared. So remember, E is giving up a little strand, giving up a little strand. So the top and bottom might have E squared, and there's a certain singular surface that's going between them where I'm merging these two guys together. If I'm working in SL3 or SLN, then the, the crossing maps to some uh, thing happening on different rungs of our ladder. And the cups turn out to look things that look a lot like a saddle that's stuck in this ladder mode. So, so it's not that any idiot could look at how duality and come up with categorification. I mean, the idiots have to, to guess the... Well, I mean, all these pictures, these pictures if you stare at these pictures, these pictures are just cross-sections of this picture. Um, like. So you just, you just add new generators that look like your gener like these pictures. You just add them. Uh, so like what would we have done in the, uh, in the, in the decategorified story? We, well, we had these weights, A, A1 through AN, and we added a picture that looked like E. You know, some representation of, you know, like moving a strand through the other strand. And 
And so here we have these new generators, so we just have to add some picture which looks like them. Uh, I mean, the relations are. There is no choice. In no, there's no choice here. I mean, you can draw it however you like, but there's there's going to be a, a unique picture that's going from E to E, and it's going to have degree two. You can draw it however you want, but the way that the way that really makes sense is to kind of think of it as a cross section of this picture. Um, I don't have a good justification for that. So you're saying, could any idiot have invented this? My claim is, using if they knew about your paper, they would probably try and invent this, like just by sticking, you know, guessing for each of these pictures some kind of a foam, and then trying to see what relations those things satisfy. So for each picture, build a foam, and then start imposing relations from the category by corner group and see what you get. So you get these new generators that look like these kinds of a thing. This picture, it's, I mean, the picture's not that great because this thing should look like a saddle and it kind of is a little wonky, but here's the beautiful thing. This is the only part of the story that I want to emphasize because I realized the previous part was really technical. You cannot define such a functor into drawers category. So we want to define a functor where we send these guys like this and we pick you know, dots for this and crossings for this. We can't define a functor into drawers category. <coughs> Um, what we can do is work with a modified foam category. This is introduced by Christian Blanchet. Uh, we call it Blanchet foams. What happens is you have to keep track of these two labeled sheets, these thick sheets. Remember I told you that zero, when, when uh, we had zero colored strands, that was trivial, and we had n colored strands, those were trivial? If we keep track of those n labeled strands, that's giving us some extra information. Um, so we really have to work in a foam world where normally the pink things would be what you would see in drawers pictures and in our pictures there's these extra yellow things and all the yellow things are doing these are going between the end labeled sheets the highest the wedge powers the highest wedge powers they just stick in signs in funny places and so normally if I had a sphere with a dot on it in drawers category I could just move that dot through the sphere and that's no problem but here there's this yellow sheet in the middle, and if it crosses the yellow sheet, I pick up a sign. And the real place, here's one place where you can see this. Um, so this is actually the net cutting relation. So just make everything a little bit, again, I'm using the convention where I don't draw things labeled zero, but now I am drawing things labeled two. And I'm putting this funny colored sheet. The yellow sheet is the, is the one where, um, this guy should be trivial. So if I delete all the yellow sheets, this looks like a cylinder. This looks like a cap cup with a dot here and a cup cap with a dot there. I could not define my two functor into drawers category because in the nil heck algebra, I get a relation that looks like this. So this minus this equals this minus this equals the identity. That would say, if I slid this guy in drawers category through this yellow sheet over to the other side, I would get this picture. And it, what would happen is that all my signs in this relation would get screwed up. The signs get messed up. But in this enhanced Blanchet version, when I slide the dot through the sheet, I pick up a sign. And it exactly is related to this Neil Hecker relation. So I'm out of time. So let me just say, well, if you look at the categorified vial group action, this is what the map is, the, the, the differential is just this cup. The image of a cup was just a saddle, so we've been recovered that uh, the differential is given by the saddle. You know, these, this is how, how we might draw pictures in drawers world. So here's the theorems. Uh, I, I realize that was a bit quick, but what are the, what are the lessons? Well, Blanchet's category is exactly what you would get if you were trying to be integral. If, so Coven homology is not functorial um, as defined. You have to work with either Clark, Morris, and Walker, where you kind of, the point is you need to keep track of the, the non-canonical isomorphism between B and B dual. That's what's going on here. And these extra labeled sheets are exactly doing that. So in Blanchet's is an alternative to Clark, Morris, and Walker, which is even more rigid. and it's claimed that, that that invariant actually is functorial over the integers. So Clark, Morris, and Walker, you need to use complex numbers. I find this very, very convincing. Why? 
the categorified quantum group didn't want to map into George category. It didn't want to, it, it, you can make it map into Clark, Morris, and Walker, but you have to force it with some signs and things like that. It naturally just wants to land in Blanchet's category. It wants to live there. And the fact that that's the integral theory is very convincing to me that this is the right sort of way of thinking about it. So the point is, if you, if you go through this whole theory, copy everything as much as you can, you'll reinvent all the graphical versions of SL2 and SL3 link theories with these extra sheets around. Um, so I claim these extra sheets are there to keep everything integral and to keep everything functorial. And Quethlick and Rose, who I should have mentioned many times by now, these are my collaborators, both very young, both very, very energetic. They actually were the driving force behind a lot of the calculations here. They, they proved it in S for SLN. And that they solved a really big problem there because for SLN, the phone categories didn't already exist. For SL2, we had drawer. For SL3, we had Kovanov. For SLN, people had written down phone categories, but if I handed them a closed phone and said evaluate it, they'd say, oh, I don't have enough relations. I'm gonna have to take that guy and interpret it as a matrix factorization, then I'll tell you what, how to evaluate it. This approach gives you a finite, you know, a set of relations and generators. What are those relations? Whatever the categorified quantum group said they were. So it invents a phone category for you where you don't need Kapustin Lee, you're able to evaluate all closed phones, you get integral SLN link homology theories, and something I probably don't really have a lot of time to talk about, but you can actually use this whole skew how framework to prove that SLN link homology theories constructed in different ways are actually the same. <coughs> calculated for like labeled by symmetric powers, like what is the unknot. He actually was able to prove, there's some conjecture or some, maybe it's been proven already about 2N torus knots in SLN link homology, whether it has, uh, that it has N torsion and that's it. He could prove things like that because he actually calculated this infinite twist for the two strands and, and actually did link homology theory using this approach. So that's why, I mean, it's not computable in the like, this computable, I don't know, as soon as you start having more than two strands, you have to do this infinite twist on multiple strands, and that, I don't think it, it's a little untrackable to calculate. But at least for two strands, Sabin was able to do non-trivial calculations in the homology. Okay, let us have the speaker again. Филипп, скопируйте. Я 